you know, we'd like to welcome everybody who showed up. Uh, good turnout. And we'd like to welcome Dr. Jiang He. Um, so his title is Capillary Seals and Petroleum Migration. A little bit about Ziyang. So he received uh, his PhD from the University of, of Southern Cal or of South Carolina. Um, and then he was a researcher at Atlantic, uh, at Atlantic Richfield, which is ARCO for 10 years. Um, and then in the year 2000, I think it was somewhat coincident when they got bought out by BP, but I could be wrong. Uh, he founded Zetaware, right? And Zetaware has grown into, um, you know, the software package that many of us lean on and lever leverage pretty, pretty heavily, you know, Trinity, Genesis, um, Kinex. Um, but on a per personal note, I invited Ziyang to, to present because I've always been impressed with his pragmatic approach to petroleum systems analysis and modeling. Um, I've also always been impressed by his willingness to kind of post and put thought provoking questions out there and try to challenge a little bit, maybe some assumptions that that need to be challenged and kind of create discussion around the field. Um, so I'm really happy that he uh, he accepted to talk about, you know, migration and capillary seals and I'll turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Hu. Yeah, thanks very much, Clay. Um, I appreciate the invitation as well. Um, yeah, I'm a, you know, I've been, I've been doing modeling for 30 some odd years and have become more and more I think learned through learning, uh, pragmatic, uh, and, and seeing things uh, from the perspective. Okay, what is the single most important thing? Uh, you know that that will control what what I'm looking into. So um, lately, the last few years, my my interests have been in um, you know capillary seals. I've been interested in this for a while, but it's more and more intensively last five years. I'm trying to also um, explain to people and um, persuade other people to to think uh, perhaps this way. I think we can get to uh, uh, a more direct impact on um, exploration um, process if we can focus on what are the most important things and what can we see from our data? So, like I said, I've been uh, doing mostly two things, um, capillary seals uh, and migration. It's, it's, it's basically uh, synonymous, the same thing to me. Migration is like dominantly, dominantly controlled by capillarity. Okay, my, I'll try to show you or I'll try to explain to you uh, and convince you that uh, in this presentation. Uh, the other aspect of it is uh, face behavior. Um, and then I, you know, uh, I and you know, a couple other people that we always share ideas and work together also think that the fluid properties innovation uh, are dominantly controlled by actually face behavior, especially in uh, basins with mixed fluids. Uh, oil and gas. Uh, that's that's a separate presentation as well. You know uh, that has been published already. I think Andrew Murray had already given one presentation at Force, like uh, maybe last year or a year before. Anyway, so let me go on with uh, th this one. Um, here are some questions that typically gets asked. Uh, some are important. Some may or may not, but it's you know, it's a part of learning. So how far can oil and gas migrate? Uh, I have a list of the basins where I've seen long distance migration. Um, they go, the longest one's 700 kilometers. There's a, quite, quite a few over 100 kilometers. You can see migration. If you just plotted up wells or fields in the basin. You know, we've been doing that quite a bit, you know, from data sets like IHS um, yeah, and other global data sets. Also, like, you know, we have millions of wells in the unconventional world. We just plot them up and we can see migration. So, um, what controls the distance? We can see that the long distance migration ones are almost mostly foreland basins or continental based sacks where there's not much relief. So a lack of relief 
is one factor for long distance migration. And the second one is probably perhaps more important is that you have a good social. It's a supply system. The distance is driven by the amount that you have. It makes. Um, migration rate is very, very slow, in my opinion. So uh, did some calculations from the source rock point of view. Uh, if you, you know, get an idea that generation occurs over about 10 million years or more. Okay, if you take the source rock and calculate the amount of oil generated over that time, uh, it's very, very slow. It, it migrates over a pore space in several years. That's how slow it creeps. It creeps much, much slower than glaciers, right? Glaciers like 10,000 times faster, right? This is the supply rate. So we also think that the migration rate in general is controlled by supply rate. I mean, you can't migrate without oil coming into the system. The last one is just a post that I posted out there and Gas is not migrating faster than oil. It's just two, two simple perspective. If you look at the basins, plot all the oil fields, gas fields in the basin, oil fields are always up dip from gas fields. So the gas, gas is not bypassing oil into the front. Okay. From a supply point of view, if both are controlled by supply, gas is generated usually late as we imagine it. And you know, it's a single phase fluid at that point. At, at the kitchen, you know, the, the depths and temperature range, pressure range, the hydrocarbon generation occurs, everything is single phase. Uh, gas is not separate from oil, so it can't migrate separately from oil, at least in the near the kitchen part, right? And once it catches up, it'll just simply gets dissolved in oil, you know, if the pressure is high. Uh, if it separates uh, from oil, Gas bubbles have actually higher interfacial tensions uh, with water than oil. So it's still not easy. But I, I go back to the observation that, you know, in most cases, oil is uplift from gas and vertically, oil is tend to be also shallower than gas. You find oil in shallow reservoirs, you find gas in deeper reservoirs in general. Okay. Um, here is um, basically where our conclusions come from. You know, we are just looking at data like this. Um, I have the actual live model in the back. Uh, if you want to go look into it, this lots of things. This is two million wells in one picture, and it's like three or four basins altogether. Uh, we have the South Texas. We Houston, you know, uh, is roughly about here. You can see these. This area is. They look like. Christmas trees. You can see two things. One, they look like Christmas trees. And it, then two, you have green above red. So I already said that we see that oil tend to be above gas, and that's where it comes from. Here you look like weather bands. Okay. These are salt diapiers. Okay. And you have stacked pay around salt diapiers for 10,000 feet. Okay, here you have rollover structures along listrick faults. This is the deltaic part of it, uh, the te uh, Texas uh, basin, South te Southwest Texas basin. There are basically walls of accumulation, stack pay, tens, even hundreds of stacked uh, reservoirs against fault. Again, the gas, the oil tends to be in the shallow part, gas is in the deeper part. And you can see vertical migration in this. And then you don't see, you see these, this is Eagleford, Austin Chalk, uh, and then you have this slope. Okay, this is the delta. Here's the slope. Okay, it's probably weighted, weighted by the delta itself. So we have a big, simple slope. Here you see a lot of lateral migration, long distance. That one is Texas oil, uh, East Texas field. It's a 10 billion barrel field. Uh, the Eagleford kitchen is over here, so it's 100 kilometers away already. Uh, lateral migration, lateral migration, lateral migration. There's not much, there's not much vertical migration here. So that's the, you know, this is all big, basically controlled by geology. And you'll see the same thing here, which I'll not get into. There's 
sub, sub details, if you are able to zoom in and rotate around, you'll see migration pathways. That black line is the outcrop. Okay, this is the Midland Basin, Wolf Camp, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is the outcrop of Wolf Camp, and it's actually over the Fort Worth Basin. If you trace the oil wells that's in the lower Wolf Camp, you go all the way up dip out to the crop. And that's over 100 kilometers long as well. It's it's really fun looking at this kind of data. Um, anyway, it's, uh, I'm going to go back to physical principles a little bit. I think most of you are, or all of you are, to some degree familiar with the concept of capillary uh, pressure. Um, we're, we're gonna, in this talk, we're going to go through a bit of that, and then we'll, we'll look at some examples or data sets, and then we'll say what we do from that. Okay. So, you know, if we think uh, migration works this way, what's our strategy or workflow to try to make predictions, basically. So one example of long distance migration, this is for, uh, this is for, this is the uh, Anadarko Basin. Okay, this is Oklahoma in the south. Here's the kitchen. And you can see these are just well locations that's trailed. This is not all of it. This, this slide on the right has a little bit more and more details. Uh, you can see this is about five kilometers, 500 kilometers away from the kitchen. It's actually going through Kansas and it's probably going into Nebraska, which I don't have data for, right? And you can see what controls it over on the right hand side too. Uh, there's a fault, basically a fault zone over here that creates a ridge. Most of the migration from both both basins, there's also a, a, a coma basin, fault follows that trend. And then there's migration along this trend that turns because this is a like a ridge, very subtle ridge. These are like very, very flat basin. Okay, this is a very subtle ridge. The, the migration just follows that ridge and then goes across. And this is the biggest gas field in North America. That's, you know, Panhandle, Hugoton Field. That's a different story, right? It's, that's very shallow. Uh, it's like 800 meters and it's under pressure. But it's the biggest gas field in, uh, in, in, in the U.S. And the field itself is over 200 kilometers long, so... <laughs> It's kind of my conclusion also that from from looking at data, looking at where fields are, looking at where we have dry holes and compare the geology that controls that, here's basically my conclusion is that the capillary seal is the single most overwhelmingly dominant factor for controlling migration. Okay. Um, important that, that's important is that if we look at sedimentary basins, we are layer cakes of things. You know, it's not exactly layer cakes, but anisotropy of capillarity is very, very, it's, it's huge. Uh, if you look at the typical clastics um, section of sand shale, right, mudstone, siltstone, the capillary intrapressure for, for among these varies by about three orders of magnitude. I think I should go on to the slide here. So on the left side, um, you have sedimentary layers in different scales, right? And you have a well log of about 150 meters, two feet of Eagleford, that's Eagleford. Eagleford is not homogeneous, it's a layer cakes by itself. Okay? And then that's Eagleford in five millimeters, it's still, still layer cakes. Okay, so going through that, you're basically going through different pore throat sizes. And capillary pressure is the entry pressure is simply a function of pore throat size, dominantly. Okay, if you look at the equation of a seal capacity, which is capillary pressure in upstairs, okay, there's some variations in interfacial tension, contact angle, wettability, but the the variable that varies the greatest is this little r, which is the pore throat radius. And 
Here's you go from silty mudstone to calcareous shales. The entry, these are the capillary curves. Entry pressures go one to three orders of magnitude. Okay, so for for an oil column to exceed these high capillary entry pressures, it needs to build a column. Some of these you require four or five hundred meter columns or even a thousand meter column. Then if you don't have a structure to host that column, oil and gas is going to be forced to migrate laterally. Basically, it becomes a competition between how big the structures are, how much relief can you can, does the structure provide to help buoyancy. A, a bubble of oil will not migrate. A bubble of oil would just get stuck in one of the pores. Uh, we we've seen like our textbooks have these ganglions like a string stringers. They don't migrate either. They'll get stuck in one of these heterogeneous parts. So you really need a connected column to be able to migrate to overcome capillary pressure, right? So that's a dominant control factor is the the layering of interbedding of our sedimentary system is very heterogeneous vertically. Laterally, not so. So it's lateral migration is a lot easier, and that's why we see those long distance migration examples, right? Um, like this one, you know, I have, I have a bunch of these things uh, in different basins. Um, so as a result, and you, you'll find that lateral migration is the dominant migration mechanism as long as you don't have a lot of things stopping it, okay? Uh, and vertical migration is pretty hard. One consequence of that is that we find oil and gas fields mostly very near short rock globally, okay? Obviously, there are basins where we have shallow oil fields like Gulf of Mexico. The oil is probably 10,000 uh, 10, feet, you know, uh, 10 kilometers. Well, nearly 10 miles above the uh, soft rock, but dominantly globally, okay, 80%, I, I don't actually have a number. If I just look at them, I say 80% or more of hydrocarbon accumulations occur within probably the first 500 meters of the soft rock, either above or below, okay? So I'm thinking about Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Persian Gulf. I'm thinking about Russia, right? I'm thinking about North America. So these are, I mean, uh, Venezuela, right? So if you look at the dominant four or five super petroleum systems, the production is mostly very adjacent, adjacent to the source rock. They don't go up very far in these systems. So if we wanted to drill a prospect or, or find oil in shallow zones, we need to find a, a, the mechanism for it to come up for, for excuse, right? So if that's not easy, we'll try to say, well, what makes that happen? And kind of that's the focus for, like nowadays we're drilling more and more deep water in the last 30 years. Now we're drilling more shallower, you know, where the source rock and the reservoir are further apart stratigraphically, uh, which is harder than if they're, you know, if you down drill the sort near the source rock, the success rate is much, much higher, right? Like, like Gulf of Mexico is pretty vertical, but the success rate for Paleozene play is probably 90%, whereas success rate for Miocene play, which is another two kilometers above, is obviously half that. And you can say the same thing about North Sea, where your middle Jurassic reservoirs versus your maybe Cretaceous versus your tertiary place. If you look at the uh, number of fields or number of dry holes, you'll find that the middle Jurassic, which is next to the source rock slightly below, has a much higher success rate, right? That's, that's because of the migration behavior, basically. This was my uh, a slice to show, well, what does capillary pressure do in terms of migration? You can you can see it rearranges oil versus gas 
and rearranges where things are. So in the in the upper left uh, slide, I have three carrier beds. If I have vertical migration with, uh, if I have weak seals, I'll see a stack pay. Uh, on the right, if I have a stronger seals, I'll see a string of fill and spill. So I have lateral play, and that's capillary. And if I have variable seals, they can get combination of the two. Right? This is by far you can just play with capillary pressure and get all three different scenarios. So the key is to learn, okay, what are the what are the typical numbers I should use? Because I can get three different answers depending on what I use, right? So that's part of my study is to globally try to gather information about what are the typical ranges of cap pressures for different depositional environments. I think we don't need to talk about the slide. Uh, it's pretty simple. Basically, uh, you need a column to exceed any pore throat. Okay, and that determines whether you have vertical migration or lateral migration, as we already discussed. Okay, uh, don't need to get into detail. One particular thing I want to mention is that I think it's it works this way. A, a capillary seal works this way. Okay. Here I already have a column. That column is in equilibrium with the seal capacity at the top. Okay. But right now things are not connected, so it's, it's not migrating. The, this oil column is stuck because the capillary force pushing uh, from the pore throat is equal to the buoyancy of that column. Now, if you feed that column with additional oil, let's say they came in bubbles. I don't think they came in bubbles. Let's say they came in bubbles, and that will get into this column, try to grow it. Then the force increases, the buoyancy force increases, and now the temporarily that the front of that column is going to try to push in and connect with that bubble that's stuck in that shale. Now we have a longer column, and then it'll connect with the next one because the buoyancy wise. Once these two additional, <laughs> this volume of, from the two additional volume uh, 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 oil co comes through the seal, it becomes equilibrium again. So that column is stuck there. So if the rock does not change ever, you can feed and you can leak, but that column will stay. It's in equilibrium with the capillary pressure. Now, this happens at a, we imagine a column, you know, tens of meters, right? But this would happen at microscopic scales too, okay? So if it's got four pore throat size, again, like a stringer, there's a capillary front that happens to, you know, get stopped at a, at the post throat just that side, just that uh, pressure to hold that column. Uh, I'll have a better picture later on here. Okay, here's how I imagine migration occurs. Uh, you have oil generated from the left side, and it's pushing into the pore system as a connected, let's say, string up. Okay, and if the forces strong enough, it pushes through that pore throat right here, which is a very narrow one, it'll actually break off. And that bubble gets stuck here. This is disconnect. They, they call it capillary snap off. So I'm going to use that term. Now for it to reconnect, you need to supply more oil to that from, from the left side. If you keep on supplying it, eventually this bubble will grow into another thing, and all three of all two of these can connect and then push through the next one. But as soon as the supply stops, they broke up again. So you bas basically will end up having these things all stuck along the migration pathway. Okay, so it might connect it. If you have some more supply, it will connect. And you can see that in experiment. This is by uh, Vassil. 
And there's quite quite a few of these like uh, pictures you can see where they try to inject oil colored from bottom of a sandbox, you know, filled with water. You can inject to some volume, and you get this pattern. But if you stop injecting, and that gets stuck, that gets stuck. You basically have two accumulations, two small accumulations, just like this one I drew in the upper part. And this one had three accumulations. Basically, if you stop injecting, you have three accumulations, or four actually. Now, if you try to inject more, it'll re it, you know, they'll reconnect and move forward as soon as you stop injecting, migration stops. These things will never keep going, right? There's a lot of our textbooks have migration keeps on going. If you just have a stringer, it'll keep going, no. Because the rock, this is pretty uh, pretty homogeneous rock. If you actually look at the real rock, it's not possible for it to continue going. And this is kind of actually a reservoir rock. It's pretty good sandstone, but you can already see the heterogeneity of it. You get oil invading this probably more porous zone, and you have oil somehow getting through to the next one. Okay, and then there's a neck in between. So if you don't supply oil, you basically have two accumulations. If you expand that into larger scale, let's say a fill spill system, it works exactly the same. If you supply oil, this one will spill more into that one. But if you stop supplying, everything is frozen again. In a vertically stacked system, it's the same way. You have basically uh, traps seals in between, which will be acting as the um, snap-off location, because that's where the capillary is highest. So if you supply, this column tries to grow, then connect the bubbles, and then the oil gets into the next sand. If you stop supplying, we have no migration. So how far this front goes depends on how much we have pumped into the system. Like in this case, we have very little, so it doesn't go very far, maybe a few centimeters, that's all. But if you keep on supplying, it'll establish larger accumulations and then go through. But as soon as you stop, because this is such a heterogeneous genius system that everything stops when you stop supplying. So what if we run out? So we have a you know finite amount of hydrocarbon generation potential from a source rock. We might run out after we uh, over matured the source rock, right? Um, but I think it actually keeps on going. Here's my slide to explain what why that is. I I can see this in nature as well, right? For some of the systems where the oil window, like you know, I had post on west of Shetland, uh, Gulf of Mexico, where Generation occurred 10, 20, sometimes 50 million years ago. But we can still see fresh migration. Like in Gulf of Mexico, we can see seeps, active seeps. But a window has, you know, uh, uh, has been through 10, 10, 20 million years ago. So here's my explanation graphically how it, how it works. So let's say we are at T1 oil window. We have a pretty layered heterogeneous system the oil would come out okay we're at t1 middle oil window we have enough oil to invade these reservoirs or traps they could be very small they could be very large okay but they are stuck here at t1 if we stop generation that oil is not going to make it up here because they're all in accumulations large and small Okay, let's go to the end of oil window. We generate it more, we start generating gas at the bottom, and we're filling these traps. Okay, and that, then at this point, we spend the oil uh, generation potential of the source rock. If we, you know, if we drill this structure at this time, we get nothing. Okay, it'd be a dry hole up dip, up, sh up sh shallow section, you know. This is also why we should drill near the source rock, because that's where the accumulations are, you know, most of the accumulations are. Now, from T2 to T3, what would happen? There's a few things still happen. 
the accumulations, because we're getting deeper, we're going to bury it further, okay? The, the oil that's retained in the source rock, we know we can retain a lot of them because we are producing them now from source rocks and the rocks near, you know, next to them. So that those accumulations now gets deeper and they start to crack, right? So heavy oil becomes light oil, light oil becomes lighter oil. What's happening is you're just increasing the gas oil ratio. Now, when you increase gas oil ratio from a black oil to a volatile oil to a gas condensate, the volume increases by about three to five factor. Okay, let's say factor of three at minimum. Okay, when you do that, you're creating more supply. That's actually about three times more than the generation window. And that's gradual, that's continuing today. And that's why we're getting charged into this very young trap, very shallow trap today, because we're actually this volume expansion of this fluid that was trapped near the short rock, which is everywhere almost, is pushing the supply, it was supplying the system. There's also, you know, additional things like compaction going on and also diagenesis going on, destroying the space that the fluids can be stored and migration continues. So it's, we call this migration lag. There are different ways to think about it, but this is my way of thinking about it. Basically, you know, generation, my, migration continues as long as the basin is being uh, still going on in terms of deposition and the burial. And that's why we see this very young, you know, even in North Sea and, you know, uh, we see very young reservoirs like sometimes 200 meters deep and they're getting very fresh oil, you know, not biodegraded for sure. Um, so migration continues today in a, a, a basin that's still receiving sediments. Um, that explains some of the situation. This was a slide to show the time lag due to that. Okay? My oil window occurred between this time and this time. My reservoirs haven't been deposited by that time. So these are the reservoirs, Miocene, Pleistocene reservoirs deposited post oil generation. And we have basically low GOR black oils in these. Okay. Uh, here's a slide to show because capillary is such a stronger force compared to other things, we could ignore because it, it's migrating so slow. Okay, uh, we have this plot that shows CA, which is capillary number. That basically is um, the speed because it's, it's basically a velocity times uh, it's a you know velocity times viscosity. Okay, and in a basin, if you look at the generation rates, basically the supply rates, we plot our rates down here about five to ten orders of magnitude below which that viscosity has any significance. So we used to model migration with Darcy flow. Basically, here I'm saying it's it's not necessary. Basically, as a supply system, you it just depends on how much you put in, okay? Viscosity drops off, just like I say, when you're walking up a hill, you know, if you're running really fast, the wind drag might be a factor. You know, if you're speed building or, or driving fast or airplane, the air viscosity has a, has a, has, it matters. But when you're walking up a hill at, you know, very slow rate, the, Gravity is the biggest force. It's like, you know, I don't know, six order of magnitude stronger than wind drag. So you don't need to worry about wind drag when you're walking uphill. You're just working against the gravity. Here I'm, I'm migrating so slow, I don't need to worry about viscosity because, like I said, it's, it cro goes across a pore in several years. It's so slow that viscosity doesn't really matter. And the capillary pressure is there because you have different rock, you know, different pore strokes. So you can model migration very simply like this. Basically, you just supply the volume and set, set up the capillary system and see how far it goes. It, that simply depends on how much you put in there. 
Here's some uh, example models. Uh, this is from my, one of my posts. Um, I just want to say that this model has only two variables, capillary entry pressure and buoyancy. Now, buoyancy, we know that exists all the time, so we can't ignore it. And, and, and it keeps on going up, obviously, it's buoyancy. Uh, the only other variable in this model is just capillary pressure, and I can duplicate this uh, accumulation very well. Okay, that gray color is just higher capillary pressure, the yellow is low. In this case, I'm actually making these faults sealed, so these fault, there's no migration across the fault, right? <clears throat> So you can make very simple models that pretty much duplicate nature by just worrying about the first order effect, which is capillary pressure. And okay, here's some few other model models to show how capillary pressure works. And this is all my recent posts on filling traps stratigraphically. So here on the left, you have a classic uh, Showalter model of migration through sand, silt, tight rock um, to create a series of traps where the reservoir of one trap is the seal of another trap. So what that mean? What does that mean? That means just that seal is relative. If you have a smaller pore throat in front of you, you create a trap. Okay, it's relative. So if I have a shale over siltstone, I have a trap. If I have a siltstone over sand, I have a trap. Okay, you just adjust your model with different capillary entry pressures and you know, create these stratigraphic traps. If you have rocks bearing across the field, you can create tilted contacts. And you can just add a hydrodynamic force to from one end to another. You can create hydrodynamic traps plus capillary seal you know, capillary pressure. Here's a more realistic, you take a well log and you say, well, the best end has zero cap entry pressure and then the other ones has slightly higher. So this shady zone has the highest and you can you can fill this one, you can see the different well water contacts. So the sandy layers have the deepest contact and the shady layers have the shallowest well water contact. This is not actually a flat, Contact. We may not recognize it most of the time in our wells, but it's not a flat surface. Uh, and it's controlled by the displacement pressure for each of these different rock types. Okay. Petrophysicists do this all the time, and these are all their their workflows. They take this, uh, which we call um, saturation versus height above free water level curves and then you apply them each one each rock type in here has one of those curves okay now i'm going to go back to the uh, picture i showed you earlier okay um you can see this is where we you know we we did this with these unconventional systems we did this with ihs data in all the basins we have any geological data on and we see this for instance, lateral migration in this wolf camp here. Okay, we got oil coming to the crop. That's lateral because we don't have a lot of structure. Okay, we have vertical. We have structure, right? So Eagleford is that. Uh, this is the East Texas field. It's a ramp, no structure, no vertical migration here, only lateral. Here I have a soil dive here to the east. I have stacked pay against that as the spindle top field, like 800 meter deep, um, 100, 120 years ago. Um, so stacked pay where you have high relief structures. On the on this part, it looks like this. These are just listric faults. You have faults that prevent lateral migration, and then it's forced to go through the shales, create stacked pay. Okay, and that's what this, you know, that part looks like. Uh, if you look at on seismic or wall logs. So basically the geology controls which way it goes. Um, but if I simplify to say, it likes to go lateral unless you stop it. So what other ways to stop it? Basically you have a four-way structure or three-way 
we have fault, we have salt, or you have pinch up, right? These are the ways to stop lateral migration, forcing vertical migration. Otherwise, it'll be lateral. A few long distance examples here. Another one, uh, still Eagle Ford. Basically, where uh, the southern part, that's that's the southern part, you have vertical migration on the right, and lateral migration in here. Um, I think the next few slides will be about, okay, if it's migration is hard, where do you find them? Basically, you find accumulations. Most stratigraphic plays are adjacent to the source rock. I had a separate talk on SEG. Basically, I, I, I kind of claimed where almost all unconventional plays and almost all large stratigraphic plays are plays adjacent to the source rock. Here, I was just giving some examples here where the large gas fields, you know, tight, tight reservoirs are next to the source rock. There's, it doesn't migrate very far above that. You can see there's nothing shallower. Um, here's a slide I had in my earlier talk that's saying, okay, basically all unconventional plays are stratigraphic traps or subtle traps, if you will. Uh, they're pretty much driven by capillary pressure as well. Basically, in, in the Midland Basin, we have these, um, we call it turbidized, but gravity flow of, you know, uh, fine grain siltstones interbedded with limestones and mudstones. We basically have stratigraphic traps. Fortunately, we have source rock almost everywhere, so everything is filled. <laughs> we can drill anywhere and find oil. But it's still controlled by the capillary system. At the bottom of this, you see this little bit of opening? There's not much. This is where it goes all the way to Fort Worth. It's following this bed. Here you have this prograding shelf, like, you know, carbonate system where it stops the migration. So there's a lot of like vertical migration on the edge here, but once you go below that, you go all the way to 100 kilometers away. These are what the unconventional system looks like. They are not homogeneous rocks, obviously. They are very, very layered, interbedded, very different capillary pressures at each zone. So we have a lot of stratigraphic traps. Okay. Now, other big fields, like this is the uh, Jubilee. It's pretty close to the source rock. I'm going to go through probably a few. This is another big giant stratigraphic trap in the North Sea, right? Um, Buzzard, Buzzard. Um, it's actually in between two source rocks, right? You have the Heather and Cambridge Clay. You have a billion barrels in between them. So these are the best places to find stratigraphic traps. Here's kind of a slightly off, so it's not quite stratigraphic, you know, uh, per se. It was, it's not necessarily near the source rock. So our um, recent Guiana Suriname play concepts where you have the source rock providing hydrocarbons. The sand fairways are some distance above that, various distances. To get to them, Obviously, like, like I said, um, lateral migration is the easiest, so it tries to laterally migrate until it gets stuck. So this model, just to show that, you have a four-way, you have a three-way against faults, or you have pinch outs, that's where, you know, this actually, most of the plays along the block, uh, Starbrook block 58 trend is actually located up above this, basically the edge of the source rock. Uh, if you look at the Kenji source rock in Guyana, Suriname, the, the accumulations are mostly above that edge of that source rock, okay? which probably says because it can't keep migrating laterally, it's forced to go up. Here's another one I tried to model. Uh, we have the recent last 10 years, we actually discovered lots of big fields in North Slope, Alaska. Okay, the Pika uh, Willow, these are very shallow Brookian place. Okay, basically four sets, um, delta shelf edge place. Um, so the migration, like I said, it's not easy in the foreland basin to go vertically, but 
when you get to the crest of this barrel arch, then it cannot continue downwards, so it gets forced up. These things line up against that high, basically, both, most of these fields. Um, they get charged through a migration. You know, basically I'm saying this is a way I would look at migration. Let's look at the geometry at what at what location should they be migrating upwards. You can build computer models, but you can also just visually analyze it. Okay. Another, well, it's the same example. I've seen this before. This is a few really long distance migration examples. We have oil anywhere between a hundred kilometer to 700 kilometers away from the surf rock, but, but all three are foreland basins, like basically it's no surprise. It basically stays in the same zone. It's like, you know, this is an Arco basin, the surf rocks down here, the Woodford. Look at all this production. It's basically following the same, you know, maybe a thousand feet up and down. It's, uh, it's in the Mississippian. There's not much production above that. There's no force that can overcome the seal capacity there because you cannot build a column. Basically, you have a lot of very thin or very low relief structures or just stratigraphic accumulations. Okay, I don't know how well I did on time. Uh, if I went longer, sorry about that. Um, basically, I think the main point is that migration is difficult vertically because we have very significant capillary contrast that the buoyancy cannot overcome. You need columns, you need enough buoyancy force to overcome that. To create the buoyancy force, you need a feature that stops, you know, it makes accumulation. And that could be pinch out, faults, salt, or three-way, four-way structures. The, the relief has to be significant enough. If you look at the big fields in North Sea, for instance, in the tertiary or Cretaceous, they all sit on basically basement highs. Uh, basically at Jurassic level, Cretaceous, uh, Jurassic level or deeper, you have big large cultures. You gather enough fluid, you have enough buoyancy to go through the system into the Cretaceous and tertiary. Okay, so you need fairly significant relief or some way of stopping it, basically. Okay? Most unconventional plays, most stratigraphic plays, the strat they are much higher risk further up from the short rock. And we need to look for them next to the short rock or within the short rock or below the short rock. They don't go very far up. Stratigraphic traps don't work some distance above the short rock. Even if you have a nice kitchen right below it, mature good oil source rock, you won't get charged if you're just sitting above it without, without any structural features. Okay. You can risk these. I'm going to go uh, quickly to uh, the methodology here. So uh, here's an example I used for how vertical migration occurs comparing two prospects. Okay, just making this up based on kind of a real example uh, from Thunder Force, I think. So I have a four-way structure here and I have three-way against the salt here. I have a sore frog in both kitchens. If I imagine how migration will occur, they will follow the stratigraphy at the very bottom level. Okay, we call those first carrier beds. Once they get stuck, they st they're forced upwards and we charge these things. Now somebody drilled a well here and find the thunder horse. Somebody drilled a well here, didn't find oil, find this biogenic gas, okay? Because it's defocused at the bottom level and oil will not simply go vertically, okay? If you're, if you're building a computer model, oil is permeating through vertically. It's probably because you didn't input or you didn't put in the capillary contrast that you will see on a log or a core scale. Okay, seismic so can't always see those things. So if you're just having homogeneous layers in your model, vertical migration is going to occur through that, which is not realistic. Um, here's just another example where vertical migration occurs, where it doesn't occur. <laughs> um, 
animation of how four-way, three-way fields are filled. They're filled backwards. We have geochemical fluid property evidence that this is how it's filled. You need the columns to push through, and they're all backfilling down to the flank. Now, how do we use this idea? So we said we needed some high relief to allow vertical migration, right? Now, if we have some prospect above the source rock, let's say a kilometer, two kilometers above the source rock. In this case, I have three prospects at this level. And I can look at the structure surface below and say, well, this one's high risk, this one's low risk, because it's sitting on a relief that allows vertical migration. This one is more likely to spill than it's low risk, it's high risk. Okay. On the left, I have this the global statistic column heights. Okay, let's say these are at least the minimum seal capacities. Uh, if you look at the global column height data, we find that the P50 is around 200 meters. Right, 200 meters is pretty good column in most basins. In deep deep water marine basins, we sometimes get to five six hundred, but it's not as often. In the deltaic system, we have columns around 50 or less, or you know sometimes 100. So these are depositional environments. And we can use knowledge from here. Like if I'm working in a delta, I'll just choose a smaller range of seal capacities, run that as the scenarios. If I run enough of them, I'll decide which one of these has a higher chance of getting charged. So I have a simple example here in West Africa. I ran this model by varying the seal capacity at the first carrier level. Okay, run that a few times, see which one of these, this is the channel over uh, structural features. So I have red lights, green lights, yellow lights. So this one's the green, and that's the discovery. And there's another green over here, that's the second discovery, I think. Uh, so far, <laughs> those are the only discoveries in here these are not sitting on structural highs they, they these are dry holes and these these two wells drilled actually before the discovery it's it's quite easy to use you just have to run a series of uh, seal capacities and then differentiate the traps um, another thing that seal capacity controls this is concept by john sales okay um, he classified traps Okay, this is not about prospecting above them. It's about what fluid you may end up having in your trap. Okay, uh, you know, most of you are probably familiar with this concept. Anyway, if you have, are in a dual phase system where the pressure is below bubble or dew point at the reservoir level, the reservoir will end up having gas if it spills, and the reservoir will contain oil if it leaks. And we see this globally as well if we look at some of the basins with large variable structures, we'll see this oil in tall structures and the gas in flat structures. And this can be risked as well. Maybe I did, uh, this is just the equation describing the same thing here. And you know, you basically formulate that into a capillary pressure versus buoyancy equation. And you have three scenarios. Now here's a quick example, right? So I have this cross section through the, uh, Mahakam Delta, it intersects four different fields. Now, if you look at the up, upper part of this diagram, basically these are the relief of these structures, okay? So the highest relief, we have an oil field. Second highest field of relief, we have oil and gas field. And the lowest relief structure, we have a gas field in, along that trend. The, the pie chart below are generated by Trinity, so if I supply a structure with column or with a with a closure, and just run the face risking tool. I get these pie charts showing. Well, this is more likely to be oil, and there's some chance that's oil and gas. This one is more likely to be gas. There's some chance that it has an oil rim, and this one is pretty much very likely to be oil. It's actually a simple tool. You can run this couple of thousand runs with different seal capacities and that's all you need 
and you generate these pie charts to uh, rank prospects by whether they're going to be oil or gas, uh, the likelihood. Um, I think this one was done by John Dawson, trying to show the orange basin. The system actually works like that. The uh, Venus discovery is basically a simple static gra graphic trap right above the short fog, like most of the other ones I've shown you. And the graph is slightly sitting higher, and it's actually sitting over a feature, structural feature that allowed vertical migration into that. Okay, so. Again, I'm going to repeat these things. Uh, basically, most of these conclusions that I've said so far, it, it's fairly simple. It's all controlled by the capillary contrast of our sedimentary sequences. And, and, and it induces this behavior where vertical migration occurs in certain places, lateral migration occurs in certain places. And also, it caused the distribution of hydrocarbon fields, accumulations globally, that also conform to that idea. So all this direct, indirect, and also basically the petrophysical principles all lead to the same. They, they, they kind of work, work together. So theory, observation, uh, validates our model. And also from that, we get methodologies to say, how do we increase our success rate? And basically what this slide says. All right, I think these, I'll not read all of these. I think I've repeated them several times and just hoping that we all um, got the basic, you know, most of it. Um, let's actually. Uh, is yeah, it that's perfect. Else? Uh, thanks for thanks for sharing and thanks for uh, getting through that. That, that uh, gives me a lot to think and chew on. Um, if you have time for questions, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, emoji applauses for you here since uh, we're on Teams. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> but uh, also, if you have time for questions, there's a question in the chat box by Pear. It's uh, how do oil properties such as CO2 and sulfur, HS and sulfur content, uh, does that affect uh, migration? Uh, uh, is, does it make it slower because of high concentrations? Do you have any thoughts around that? Uh, I think there's two questions there. I think um, things, I believe that migration rate is supply driven because we have, have such a heterogeneous system where it won't go very far on itself. So it basically gets trapped along the way. It's just that if you don't have traps, they'll be trapped along small accumulations, sub, you know, uh, sub-economical, sometimes poor scale accumulations that are kind of connected. So that system is volume driven. So anything that affects volume affects that to some degree, but the volume is quite uncertain. Uh, you know, if you made hydrocarbon generation models, you'll see uh, if you just, like a risk your source rock properties, TLC, you know, generation potential, maturity, you risk that you find yourself uncertainty around factor of two to three. So given those uncertainties that are so large that, that this, there's other things that also affect volume will come, you know, in theory have an effect, but we won't be able to appreciate it compared to the largest one, which is how good is the source rock? You know, we drill wells on high, so we don't really know very well the source rock properties in the kitchen. It could be much better, you know, uh, in terms of quality and thickness, and that could easily double the volume. So I, I take the risking approach to that. So which is, they all have a fact, you know, they all have an impact, but relatively small compared to the largest uncertainty, then they, 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 they can be studied but not necessarily uh, impact things right but as co2 i want to touch on and the second point is which usually we talk about in our face um, face risking uh, 
presentation. CO2 and H2S have a big impact on uh, PAT behavior of hydrocarbons. So if you add CO2 to an oil gas system, it basically uh, it, it makes the gas and oil makes it easier for them to dissolve each other. Basically, it reduces bubble point or dew point, sometimes by a lot. So you can imagine you had a gas, a gas cap over an oil accumulation. If you didn't have CO2, that's what you get. And gas, this is phase separate. They have a gas cap and oil lag. But if you put the CO2 in there, then the gas will dissolve in oil. It, it helps them dissolve each other. We've seen that a few times uh, where CO2 does that. H2S does that as well. I mean, we just don't want to see H2S anywhere. Hope that answers that. Yeah, the other question, uh, can I share it? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll make it available, but it, you know, only in PDF, I'm afraid. Uh oh, I, I'm not hearing though. Sorry, I muted myself so that I wouldn't interrupt your question. Um, yeah, we're out of time, so people will start trickling out, I'm sure. But uh, if you have time for one more quick question, there's a question of how important are diffusion effects to overcome capillary barriers? I would just go with this. Um, I would look for evidence that that has or has not impact. We have old fields sitting in reservoirs for 100 million years. If they're still there, at least the diffusion didn't destroy it over that time. Yeah. And a few old ones, the oldest one I could think of is some of the biggest fields, which like quite a few billion barrel fields in eastern Siberia. They're very shallow. They've been sitting there for 500 minutes. So, so the petroleum system model showed, showed that, it's, that they, these were charged about in Cambrian. Time. So these are actually Precambrian reservoirs charged in Cambrian time, and it's been uplifted sitting there since then for 500 million years, and they're still there. They're gas fields and oil fields. So it's, you know, presumably gas is more diffusive. It can diffuse and lose a few, some. I don't know what. Uh, and the, the other. Um, Aspect of this is that people who look at diffusion, model it, all say, I'm not an expert, I didn't look into it very much. They say diffusion is a very, very slow process for even methane within the reservoir so that you can see this equilibrium on the order of millions of years for methane to equilibrate with the oil column. I guess that's kind of the indirect evidence for what I'm saying. I I don't I don't know precise answer to that question, but I, no, no, I'm not too perfect. worried because I can see, you know, the the other example I often cite is the Drake well. Uh, if you ever heard of that, that's the first oil well drilled in U.S. Uh, 1860 something. So it found oil at 70 feet below ground in Pennsylvania, first ever, you know, uh, exploration well. Uh, it's fresh good oil and it's been sitting there since, I think the uplift of the, the, the Appalachian Basin was 200 some million years ago. So it's been coming up and it's 10,000 to 15,000 feet of erosion. Finally, this thing is sitting now, I think it's been sitting there for at least 100 million years, very, very shallow and still there. Mm. Okay, so these are kind of analog examples I often use to validate, you know, if I if I think a certain way, I'll use these. Sure. Yeah, about the, the low probability of diffusion. Good. All right. One more question, and then I think we'll uh, we'll call it good. But uh, Balish has a has a question there for you about uh, downward hydrocarbon migration. In many areas in the North Sea, UK and Norway, there are drilled dry structures underneath the main source rocks like Droughtna, where the downward hydrocarbon migration seems to have failed. 
What is the thickness of lean shales where the downward hydrocarbon migration could still work? Uh, can get complicated as there is always a down dip kitchen, uh, which might be in direct connection to the reservoir. So, what what are the controls on on downward migration? I guess is the. So I'm back on my blog. I uh, have a. I just searched on the blog downward, and I get this page uh, here. I list um, my my observations of where I've seen downward migration. Mm. Okay, North Sea is definitely one of them because your middle Jurassic is below your drop now, right? Um, there's a lot of accumulations. You can drill dry holes, obviously, um, upward uh, or downward. Um, now, capillary-wise, theoretically, it's harder for it to go down through another shale, right? So you have a carrier bed below the source rock, and you have interbedded stuff below that, right? So theoretically, there's no buoyancy going through unless you fill the, the, the first trap right the, directly below the source rock. If you had more reservoirs further down, I guess North Sea people argue there's lateral migration into even older rocks. Um, but some of these examples do have at least some distance between the source rock and the deeper reservoir. But I think that's higher risk. I think the three forks uh, in below Bakken, so you have Bakken, middle, middle Bakken is the reservoir, but then you have the three forks, the several sands below Bakken that are still drilled and producing. But the further down you go, obviously higher the risk. You know, theoretically you can go up dip and then stratigraphically go further deeper. Okay, if you don't allow vertical migration to continue, it can go downwards as well. You know, you, you can make a capillary model ha have to go through another shale below. Mm -hmm. But I think that just increases, uh, reduces the probability. Yeah, I mean, it's higher risk further down. But directly below, it's not everywhere as well because there's always a stratigraphic or structural element to it. So not everywhere you drill directly, you know, even if your sand is below below the source rock, you'll still draw, drill dry holes in the wrong spot, right? So it's not everywhere. Like uh, uh, Woodbine in below Eagleford is the, it's also the biggest oil field in the US, actually conventional. It's a strat trap. It's a Woodbine sandstone directly below the Eagleford, right? It's over 10 billion barrels in place. But along the way, you can drill a lot of dry holes because all the oil went up to the pinch out, right? And then down dip, you have no structure to trap it. So it simply went down and migrated up, up dip. I don't know if that answers that question, but you know, drilling dry holes is it's not surprising to me, <laughs> right? Um, but I'm also seeing lots of basins where down dip migration occurs, right? Um, Perfect. Yeah. Um, I well, like, good. You know, well, thanks uh, again. And thanks for all those that uh, attended. We had a good turnout. Um, maybe when that is available, when you convert it to a PDF, Ziyong, just let me know and we'll figure out an easy way to, if it's too big for email, we'll figure out an easy way to yeah, transfer yeah, it on be, SharePoint or something. Okay. I think it's, uh, it's a relatively small, about, about 40 slides. So okay. I'll make a PDF and email it to you. Great. Thanks, just, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Claudia, and uh, uh, thanks to everybody who is still hanging around. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, you all po probably have my contact, so just email me or pay me anytime on uh, any platform. So. Perfect. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank bye. you. Bye. Bye now.